Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. I am here. My name is Peter Englert. I'm one of the co-hosts of this show. I'm here with our illustrious communications director, co-host, Aaron Mercer. Aaron, good to see you. Good to see you. I don't know how I got that illustrious co-host. By the way. <laughs> Look, at see, he's impressed. Yeah, I know. That is impressive. I did not. Should I stand? <laughs> <laughs> And this, ah. and this wonderful uh, gentleman that's here today, his name is Wally Fleming. He's a pastor. Um, he also works at Roberts Wesleyan College. I'd be remiss to also call out to you our um, fantastic producer, Nathan Yoder. Wally, like, I, I just love You just jumped right in. Well, uh, this is an inviting, welcoming spot. I'm assuming it's a safe spot for me. Well, you know, we'll find out after oh, the okay. recording, okay. but I think it's safe. <laughs> but... Uh, Today, um, so this episode was actually Aaron's idea, and I had like three people say, hey, we need to ask this question, why are there sermons in church services? Which led me to Wally, and Wally has a long history as a pastor, not only in the church, but also on a college campus. So, Obviously, you've never heard my sermons, if you invited me at for this theme. <laughs> I, I've heard a lot about your sermons. I've, I've heard one or two of them. I, I went there once, but anyways, Aaron, before we jump over to Wally, what, what are some of your thoughts? Because this was this episode was your idea. Yeah, no, I first of all, thank you so much for being here, Wally. It's just it's a great. blessing to meet you and to have you on the podcast. And uh, yeah, no, I, I think, uh, Peter, this was it's something that I was I was sitting listening to, uh, you know, a church message, a sermon, and you know, not, not that it was good or good or bad or whatever. That had nothing to do with the thought necessarily. But it was as I was sitting there, I was just for some reason it occurred to me. I said, you know, I've been going to church pretty much my whole life. Why do we do this? Why do we have yeah. church organized the way we do? Where generally the sermon is kind of a something we have first of all, because we don't do that in a lot of other places in life. Why do we sit and listen to a someone talk to us. Once someone pontificate. Right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I, so I, it, had, it occurred to me and I thought, you know, this would be a fun thing for us to talk about. If, if I'm thinking about it, I have to assume there are other people who wonder the same thing. So that's, that's my thoughts right there. How do you want to take this, Peter? Before we jump in, Wally, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more? Tell us a little bit about sure, your story. Sure. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a warm evangelical home. Uh, at a church that would probably be termed now fundamentalist. So um, I'm still uh, going through process of growing and developing in my faith, but grateful for the foundation I had. Devoted mother, t devoted to the Lord. My father held Jesus at arm's length until he was diagnosed with cancer as a relatively young man and over a six-course illness that resulted in his death, I saw him come to Christ, and I saw in him life in the midst of his wasting away, which mm -hmm. had a profound impact. I was 15 years old at the time. I went to Houghton College, and there um, I think owned the faith for myself after reading Mere Christianity, and uh, kind of said all that I had learned growing up I think is good and true. Mm. Uh, went to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary to run away from the church I grew up in, there was no one else from that denomination, and I found a history of our denomination in a dusty bookshelf. Took it home from the library at Gordon Conwell, read it, and said, why am I running away from this? And uh, so I uh, decided to uh, become a pastor in the tradition in which I grew up, and pastored for 38 years, uh, retired in 2017, um, but I'm continuing to teach at the college and seminary out at Roberts, and love doing that. And I love the church, love the Lord, Love coffee and conversation. Can I put all those in the same phrase? Of course you can. You're on the Why God Why podcast. Uh, <laughs> so. Let's. Uh, You've never asked why God created coffee, have you? Oh, because there's there's no reason to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, That's a great question. I, I mean, maybe there's someone out there, but I don't need to know why to enjoy it. So. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Anyways, let me. Uh, let's start here. Um, so. The question I want to ask you, how did you become so passionate about preaching? But something I don't think our listeners understand is um, not every pastor, like, loves preaching. Right. Not, like, some pastors actually get into pastoring because they love people. And mm -hmm. I'd even say the preaching ones, they love people. It's just, it's different. And I've heard a couple pastors retire and they say, wow, I don't have to preach a sermon every yeah. week. So. Yeah. 
I guess I'd kind of, as someone that was preaching every week, now you're in a little bit of a different role. I'd love to hear why you're passionate about preaching, but even your yeah. journey in preaching yeah. too. Yeah, let me see if I can put those together. Um, I love preaching because I still think proclaiming God's word to a particular people, a geography, at a particular time is powerful. Mm. My wife and I were recently uh, vacationing with such, some friends in Clearwater Beach, Florida, and we went to a dinner spot that had live music. And there was something tangibly different about sitting there listening to this musician interacting with the audience that was enjoying dinner than if we would have just had a soundtrack playing. Mm. And I think that analogy holds up for the church. There's something powerful about the act of preaching. I preached uh, three sermons at uh, my last uh, church uh, on a weekend, and every sermon was the same but different Hmm. because the composition of those in the worship center were different each sermon. There was a different dynamic. There's a very uh, existential dynamic to preaching that I love. So uh, preaching did not begin well for me. Uh, Let me tell you, my first sermon was at a church when I was attending Gordon Conwell. I was a youth pastor at a United Methodist Church in Saugus, and the pastor, Willis Miller, asked me to preach at a Sunday evening service. So I panicked, put together a sermon. Uh, Fortunately, I don't have any record of that sermon. (laughs) Went to the church and at 10 to 7 got up on the platform of this big old gothic sanctuary and the pastor Willis uh, sat in the first row and at 7 o'clock nobody had come and at 7.10 after we both sat there awkwardly he said, hey, let's go get pizza. (laughs) So we went to a pizza shop on US 1 and as we walked in Judy Collins was singing Send in the Clowns which for me has become the defining moment of my ministry. (laughs) So I always say to people when I'm coaching new pastors, your first sermon's gonna go better than mine because (laughs) nobody even came for mine. But um, I discovered over the course of my pastoral ministry that wonderful things happen in the midst of preaching Mm. that I can only say is a God thing. It's, It's not the preachers making it happen, Uh, We would like to think sometimes we do, but there's a marvelous way God's at work in the midst of the sermons. And I think people over the course of regularly attending worship uh, can grow and mature through good biblical preaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why, I mean, why do we do it? What, what, what even led to, is it just, uh, I mean, if it's a tradition that we've kept up, I mean, why did it even start in the first place? Yeah, that's a good Good question. Well, there's, there's several thoughts I have there, and let's see if they make any sense at all. Um, one is, uh, isn't it interesting that the Word is how God has revealed himself in Christ Jesus? Mm. So the Word, that communication is somehow uh, central to who we are. Uh, I believe we are people of story. We have a narrative that we live out of. So the history of Scripture tells us that in the Old Testament, uh, preaching was uh, significant. I I mean, the prophetic voice especially. Um, uh, Moses, uh, Abraham, there were these assemblies before the people of Israel. There was this oral communication. And then in the New Testament, uh, Jesus, at the outset of his public ministry, gets up in front of a synagogue and preaches from Isaiah. And it must have been a powerful word because they take him to a cliff to throw him off the cliff. I mean, there was something that happened in that message. So this idea of applying God's word to a particular place and a particular people at a specific time is has a long, rich history. I would argue it's it's in the fabric of creation. Mm. And even with all of our technology and all the info that we get from so many different sources, there is still something very authentic and powerful about sitting with a group of people and hearing someone say, let's look at the Word of God. Mm. And what does God say to us here and now? I, mean, I love that. I think that's precious. There are holy moments that happen there. So I'm sold on the value of preaching. Uh, someone interviewed John Stott before his death, a great British pastor, and said, what do you think of the state of preaching? This would have been maybe five or six years ago, if I'm recollecting it properly. He said, it's abysmal. Mm. 
terrible. And he goes on to talk about the lack of biblical preaching. And he says, why don't we have more biblical preaching? And he says, it's because it's hard. It's mm. hard to do biblical preaching. And most pastors, I think this is maybe another subject, we get so caught up in all the things of ministry that uh, we don't take the time to really interact with the Word of God and let the Word of God challenge us and to understand what, what does this say now to us here. Mm. Am I allowed to pound the table here? Of course. Absolutely. Okay. So something that, because I, I think it's a hint to Aaron's question, because I think this will help us actually unravel the question behind the question. Um, I think what I'm hearing you say is, like there's maybe one to five verses off like the top of my head. And I did a little research like, you know, one time I think Paul says to Timothy, you know, in the New Testament after Jesus died and rose again, he says, preach the word. Yeah. But, you know, I think what you're saying is there's an assumption throughout the Bible that there's some type of oral proclamation. And so like this just isn't something so I'm thinking about our listeners and I'm trying to kind of formulate how I said, like we've talked about before, like in the Bible, there used to be like, there's certain meats that you can't eat. Like if you go to the old Testament, you can't have bacon. Right. Like you can't eat anything from pigs. I eat bacon. I don't feel guilty. I had bacon yesterday, you know, and I, and I guess, you know, from your vantage point, mm -hmm. why is preaching, this is terrible. Why is preaching not bacon? Yeah, right. Well, um, let me comment. I think bacon is one of the great things of the coming kingdom. <laughs> uh, but I think um, the church, look at the origin of the church, Acts 2. Mm. So this is a powerful manifestation of the Spirit. Tongues of fire. And what happens? Peter gets up and does this marvelous exposition of an Old Testament passage to say, here's what God is doing and saying right now. Mm. 3,000 people respond, and the church is born. There is something significant, I think, that at the genesis of the church, of which we are a part of, it was a sermon that got things rolling. Now, I don't want to overstate the case, because there are many elements of worship. We could talk about communion, we could talk about music, we could talk about mm. just the reading of scripture without any kind of comment on it. All of those things are powerful. But I think there again, there's something woven into the fabric of having someone who has taken time, hopefully, to do the work, prayerfully considered what God is saying to that congregation to interpret the word of God. Uh, I think we need that. Well, and, and I think something else that you're hitting on, too, of why we assume this, especially when you go to the New Testament, these letters, so books that are after Acts, right. so Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, like these were literally letters that were read in churches. Yes. Like, so it's it's not just like preach, like... No, like you're actually, and you mentioned Jesus, the greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount. Like the writers of scripture are literally writing sermons for people yeah, to hear. Yeah, yeah. There again, there's something about being human where we gravitate to story. And for someone to say, here's the story of God. Mm. This is what God is all about and what he's doing in the world. And here's how you, Peter, can become a part of that story. I think when that happens, uh, that's, that's incredible. It's a marvelous moment when that happens. And I have loved as a pastor being able to have a kind of a front pew view of that mm. happening. Mm. When you, so this is, uh, this is really interesting. There's a couple of different ways. I'd love to, love to continue this conversation. Um, but Back to bacon? That, well, <laughs> you know, bacon, yes. That's the candy of meat, right? Bacon. That's right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So when you when you've preached sermons in the past, or when you've taught others um, at the seminary or elsewhere, um, do you do you approach the message, the sermon, whatever you want to call it, as something you're trying to drive home? Something someone needs to take take into them for a lifelong lesson, or are you approaching it more week to week? Like this is what you need to hear right now in the context that you're in yeah. today, this week. Are you trying to get them through to the next 
next time you meet, whether that's a Wednesday or a Sunday or whatever, or is there, are you trying to drive home an eternal point? Yeah. Well, I don't think my sermons ever got anyone through anything, so <laughs> I want to just express that. Okay. I think there's a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. So I believe in the, over the long haul, if you're listening to a, a capable preacher over many weeks, months, years, there's going to develop in you a way of approaching Scripture. You're going to learn how to interpret the Word of God. Um, so there's that long vision. There is that week to week, and some weeks it's more poignant. After 9-11, um, uh, there was, I'm sure, a flurry of changing text for that next Sunday mm-hmm. sermon, saying Tim Keller took... Um, where Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus and did a magnificent job of taking that text and applying it to a time of national grief. So I think there's both elements, Mm. the long term and the short term. The short term is more poignant at some events than others. You know, if it's okay. Yeah, please. I'll answer a little bit. Um, I love what you're saying. I, I think so I want to tell our listeners the process I went through in preaching. So, you know, when I first started preaching, um, I was like 13 and it was all about illustrations, you know? And so I'll never forget, um, God's grace is really good. Like I, I took a presidential speech that mentioned faith, hope, and love. And that was my Sunday night sermon. (laughs) And I met, um, I met a pastor by the name of Roland Howard. He actually lives in the Sodus area now. And I'll never forget, he didn't say, you're a heretic, you didn't use the Bible well. He said, hey, just come to my office. And he he actually started teaching me how to preach. And then it went. I went through this series starting from high school into college where it was, I'm learning so much about the Bible yeah. that... I need to be a running commentary. Mm. So I went through this phase where it's like every Greek word, every context. And then that kind of led to a a phase of now it's all about application. You know, okay, let's take everything. They don't need to know every Greek word that you're preaching and stuff like that. And I, I feel like the season I'm in now, and I think this is part, by no means am I old or something like that, but... I feel like there's a familiarity with the Bible in a good way where there's certain things that I know, but then there's certain ways that it speaks. Yeah. But the bigger question that I deal with when I'm preaching, and I, in the most healthiest of ways, I feel most connected to people when I'm preaching because I'm asking this, how in the world is this passage going to meet this person at Browncroft Community Church in Rochester, New yeah. York? in the year of our Lord, 2022. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm wrestling yeah. with. Yeah, you have a heart of a preacher. See, mm-hmm. that's that's it, right? Um, uh, you know, one person said preaching is a Bible in one hand and newspaper in the other. It's that idea of, that's that's where the rub is. How do I not only appropriately handle the text, and that takes all that expertise you were talking about, which I still find challenging. Mm-hmm. How do I take that text and apply it and not reduce it to simplistic, moralistic preaching? Or how do I stay away from making my story the primary story? Or how, you know, one uh, pastor who I uh, enjoyed uh, his his writings said something to the effect that uh, the danger is that we can present the fruits of our own imagination, (laughs) you know? So how do I appropriately illustrate and make this interesting, but still remain faithful to the text and not deviate from this is the word of God that we've come. People come to church. They don't want to hear Wally Fleming. Mm. They want to hear what does God say? Does God say anything into my life Mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. Um, And I want them to go away with some biblical meat that they've had or biblical bacon to use that analogy. (laughs) As as you're, you know, I'm so I guess jumping off of that a little bit um you know you're talking about a a pastor uh having a or a preacher having a connection to the the people who are in in front of you know that are sitting there in the congregation and uh, listening attentively listening hopefully (laughs) listening attentively not being distracted by babies crying in the back or whatever you know or whatever was in the newspaper they just saw yeah i don't know um but uh 
what do you, th- you know, we, we've gone through kind of an interesting season here. Uh, and, and I, I wonder, actually, I'm curious if this has come up in some of your classes too, but do you see, uh, what do you see for the future of preaching as when you start or the, the current, the today of preaching, when yeah. you start talking about, um, online opportunities, uh, you know, where does preaching, where does preaching fit in, number one, and where does preaching to a local congregation fit in in the midst of all that? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think we're just beginning to unpack that. So let me just tell you over my journey. So I preached my first sermon in the late 70s, 1970s, and then we were on a 1950s model of preaching, three-point homiletical sermon, um, and kind of there were these great pulpiteers that would have this more formal approach to preaching. Of course, everyone was wearing suits and white shirts and ties, and it was a whole different environment. And then we moved to, um, I think, uh, in the 90s, to a much more engaging informal, which has still affected preaching. I mean, preaching is a much more informal event than it was 50 years ago. And um, we're much more casual, and there's much more of a narrative approach uh, which I think is healthy. I think it's a recapturing of the biblical mm-hmm. approach because I think if you study the scriptures that the people of God gathered around to hear the exposition um, was often through story and narrative. This is the great acts of God. Look at what God has done, the Exodus, and all the other things that he has done. So I think this approach to narrative is encouraging to me, and we're getting away from what I think is still a burden of the Reformation, where everything became analytical Mm. and doctrinal. If you believe this doctrinal statement, you're thriving as a Christian, where I think you can have the best doctrinal statement in the world, and your heart can be far from Jesus. So I think that inviting people into narrative is much more helpful. So I like what's happened to preaching in that regard. My criticism of preaching today is sometimes it's become too much about the communicator and not about the scripture. So I went, I was on sabbatical uh, a few years back and I had the opportunity to go hear other people preach, which I thought, oh, this is gonna be so cool. (laughs) I went to one church and the entire sermon had not one reference to the word of God. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I thought, what has happened if we can preach a sermon? uh, Have we become Oprah? Uh, What's going on here that we're not wrestling with the word of God? So. uh, I share a little bit of John Stott's concern that he expressed, that there is some abysmal aspects of preaching today, but I'm encouraged by many young preachers who I think hunger to unpack the Word of God. Mm. You know, as you're talking, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners listen to the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, the podcast, and... um, I listened to that again this morning. I had my students at the seminary listen to it as an assignment. Oh, wow. Maybe we need to do an episode about that. But just for this part, you know, one of the things, so it's a podcast about a church that, um, for those of you who don't know, there's a story about that, how this church was really growing and there was definitely some issues that the church ends up closing. But one of the things that they kind of started out was um, they started doing online ministry and they ended up almost franchising the church branding it branding it and you know we have a communications director so we'll we'll talk about branding a little bit but what can we throw him under the bus no okay. not yet you not can yet do that. That's he's he, he's a good soul I can take but, it. but um the the branding and the franchising because it led to starting a mars hill in albuquerque And they were feeding in Mark Driscoll. Mm -hmm. And one of the people said something that was so poignant, which was Mark Driscoll lives in Seattle, has no idea what people in Albuquerque are facing. Yeah, which is the limit of the online live streaming kind of thing about services, right? I mean, I can sit and be passively watching this, and it may not have any relevance to me. I think that whole the rise and fall of Mars Hill, and if people haven't read, listened to that podcast, I think they should, because it shows the danger of what can happen with preaching, and that it becomes about me mm. and my branding and my opinions rather than 
being self-effacing and revealing the Word of God. There's a danger that. There's a little bit of a cult of personality in the church at some times. Yeah, I want to come back to that because I think our listeners are going to want, and I guess what I struggle with is like when you don't bring up the Bible. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to even think of like the last, I think the last time I preached was in July 3rd and it had to do with uh, the image of God. Ah. And um, was there scripture in the message? It, it was, it was Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Um, but, you know, I, I think the part that I'm forever remembering is like, I'm trying to tell the story of Genesis to a group of people that have may have heard this passage a thousand times to someone that hasn't said, watched it. And I think the tension that came out to me that it's like, if you don't know this, this passage makes no sense. It's the original readers who read, who read this passage. Number one, there was no fight between the gods mm -hmm. of creation. And number two, the, when God says that he creates human beings in him in his image, it wasn't a Pharaoh. It wasn't a King. It wasn't a queen. It was everybody. Yeah. And like, you know, I'm getting goosebumps and even emotional thinking about it because to be able to tell people that yeah. and you can visibly feel it in the room, Aaron might think otherwise. He had to hear the practice message and all of that, <laughs> but to have people go, Oh yeah. Yeah. This is powerful. Yeah. Yeah. What have we done if we have reduced all of that mm. to just nice stories mm. and moral tales and interesting messages? I mean, I mean, you're talking about an incredible biblical truth. We're made in the image of God. Wow, we should be stunned by that, right? That should shape how we think about each day we live. So I'm with you. It sounded like it was a good message. I should have been there. I, I don't know, but uh, you know, it, it's online. <laughs> <laughs> I will listen to it. Let me let me let me ask you this, and then because I want to, because you said this a, a number of times. Um, Am I repeating myself? No, no, no. You're doing it in a good way, <laughs> but I I think it's helpful for our listeners. I think a lot of our listeners would say, as a Christian, you're supposed to be moral. Sure. But you're saying moralism. Help our listeners understand why that's important in terms yeah. of preaching in Christianity. Well, I think there's, uh, I think the challenge is true discipleship. Mm -hmm. So true discipleship for me, and I haven't thought deeply of how to define it, but it is this personal relationship that's vital and living and daily with Jesus. I follow Jesus. Not the Jesus I want to follow, but the biblical Christ mm -hmm. and uh, where he challenges me. So I, um, I believe discipleship is at the core of what we're trying to do in the church through preaching, f raise up mature disciples in Christ. The danger is we can just become uh, Sunday school about it. And mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to throw Sunday school under the bus, but this idea that if I just do these certain things, I'm being Christian. Mm -hmm. And my experience has been you can do a lot of those things and your heart can be far from God. Mm -hmm. And you can have far from a biblical worldview. So how do we form a biblical worldview that's a vital living relationship? So I, I think sermons should carry us to that deeper level. Mm -hmm. This is not just, oh, did you tithe this week? And are you faithful to your spouse? And are you doing all the things you should do? Are you grasped by the reality of the resurrected Jesus? Uh, can I read you a quote by James Stewart, mm -hmm. great preacher in Scotland in the first half of the 20th century? I love what he says here. He says, suppose the apostles were to come back to earth today and watch us at our weekly worship service. Would they recognize the religion in whose dawn they had found it such bliss to be alive? Might they not have to say what has happened? Is this the faith that once stirred the world like a thousand trumpets? Is this the miraculous religion that burnt us with its flame? How can these, our descendants, repeat with a chill of lackadaisical boredom words that once awakened the dead? God was incarnate. Can they say that and not be thrilled and dazzled by the statement of it? The Son of God was crucified, dead, and buried. Can they think of that and not be overwhelmed by its awful meeting? 
Christ is risen. Can they tell that and not want to shout for the glory of it? Why have they allowed these breathlessly exciting facts to be written in the dull catalog of common things and suffocated by the formalities of routine religion? Mm. You see, I think preaching at its best breathes life Mm. into Christian doctrine and removes just being a moralistic way of life. It's something that is life-giving. Wow. Well, I was about to ask you, you know, but maybe you already answered. I don't know. What's the what, what's the best sermon you've ever heard that hit, that uh, does that? I mean, you just preached a powerful Can I tell you the there. worst sermon I ever heard? In one of my first uh, sermons in the church I pastor in rural Pennsylvania, I got up to preach about Daniel and the lion's den. And the whole sermon, I said, David and the lion's den. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife was going through conniptions in the pew, trying to signal to me that I was... So um, I know bad (laughs) preaching because I've done it. Uh, Sermons that are memorable. I was a student at Houghton College when Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, former president of Asbury College, now Asbury University, came and preached on Genesis and on Genesis 3 and the fall. And it was powerful, the conviction that fell upon that gathering of students. And college students are a hard, hard audience. And I will never forget that night. Mm. It just started a group of students going up to testify to God's cleansing work in their heart and the service went on for hours of these testimonies. It was it was a God moment. It was powerful. So I think a, a sermon like that. Yeah. And you could never have created that event. I'm sure Dr. Kinlaw didn't plan that to happen. But I think the preaching that night allowed that to happen. Mm. Gave permission for it. Mm. Do you think that we... Um, I mean, maybe the question that even started this whole conversation um, could be heard as a an undervaluing of the preaching. Do you think that that's true? And also, do you think that we ever, either preachers or congregation, do we do we put something on? Do we put a value on the emphasis more than we should? I, I guess I, mm-hmm. I'm not exactly sure what I'm trying to say, but do we do we have it in its right spot? Um, I don't think we often do. Hmm. So I think, let me speak as a preacher. I think preachers are always in danger of letting their ego get in the way. Um, I want people to like me. Hmm. I want people to go out of church saying, my, that was a marvelous word. So it's far easier to preach on grace than it is for me to preach on sin. So there's always that dilemma as a pastor of how do I preach a balanced meal to my congregation of the scriptures. Um, So there's that danger of the ego, which you have to, there's a little bit of headiness about preaching. Preaching can be a, um, you can go out of a service after preaching and be pretty pumped up. Um, So that's a danger, you need to watch that, which is always good to have a good spouse who says, well, it wasn't that good. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I used to go home Sundays exhausted after pre- I think preaching is exhausting and I would go home and I'd be discouraged because it never quite went what I thought and I'd say to Mary I quit and bless her heart she would say okay what do you want to do I said I think I want to go down and open up a bike rental shop in Key West Florida <laughs> and she'd say okay tomorrow we'll talk about doing that Let's just rest the rest of the day. So uh, to have someone that keeps your level headed is great. Um, But there's another part of me that says, we are in such a cynical age, I think, that people too often approach preaching with the wrong attitude. Mm. It's like, impress me. Mm. Uh, Are you gonna gonna make me laugh? Mm. Or are you gonna dispel all my stereotypes? Uh, And so we have preachers who have become, I think, less than what they're called to be where they start using language. And uh, I mean, I've heard sermons where preachers use vulgarities and I think they're trying to play to the crowd. They're trying to see how, see how authentic I am. Mm. Um, and I feel bad for that happening. And I think some of that has been created by congregations where there is this expectation that you're going to do something exceptional to get my attention. Mm. Mm. That's a lot of pressure to put on a preacher. Yeah, and you know it, it's interesting as you're talking, and I like where kind of Aaron's going because 
you know, on one hand, you know, we have the cult of personality, yeah. which I think celebrity pastors is changing. But then on the other hand, there's this huge expectation on preaching that it's going to meet you. And, you know, we've done that. We did an episode on, you know, why doesn't my pastor understand my generation? Mm. We had an author, his name's Daryl, on about, um, you know, about preaching to each generation. And the book's phenomenal. But what's difficult about it is, like, that's another layer in the preaching. And, you know, even just, it was interesting, you know, you made a passing comment about, you know, you probably did a great job in that sermon. And I don't know if you feel this way. It's weird accepting a compliment yeah. about a sermon because the best compliments to me aren't, it's a great sermon. The best compliments to me are, hey, when you said this, I feel like God leading me to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's this odd, I can't, I can't put it in any other category because it's this odd thing where, Yes, God is working through you and you're there, but you know, I think every time I preach, I the first 30 seconds is the hardest. Yeah. I'm questioning everything. Yeah. There's that sense of inadequacy. Yeah. Right? Like who am I? Or, or is this even going to make sense? Yeah. Like am I just going to blow myself up here? Yeah, someone told me, and I don't know if this is true, I should have checked this, but uh, that the word pulpit comes from a Latin derivation that referred to the scaffolding used for hangings. <laughs> that every time you step into the pulpit, in a sense, you're putting your head in the noose. Are you going to be faithful to the Word of God uh, or not? Um, and there is, uh, I don't know about you, Peter, but for years, Saturday nights were ordeals for me. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night often and say, I can't do this. Um, what am I going to say? Even though I had prepared a message and prayed over it, there was always that sense of inadequacy. So uh, I talked about the danger of ego in preaching. I think there's that other extreme, the danger of uh, how can God use me? Hmm. Because the amazing thing is God uses people made in his image hmm. to speak his word. I mean, he's, he's decided to do that. How incredible is that? So to be faithful is mm. what we need to do in preaching. It doesn't have to be successful, mm. but faithful. You didn't let me answer. Uh, Aaron, you didn't know that you were kind of co-hosting by yourself, but I, I wanted to answer the best sermons. So oh, if sorry, that's okay. Peter. No, 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 it's okay. Right, I just, yeah, what's the uh, best sermon you've heard? Well, so I haven't heard it, but I think most people would probably say the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus uh, in Matthew 5 through 7. You know, that's a children's moment answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It must be Jesus. <laughs> it's okay. got to be Jesus. Yeah, uh, thanks. He just did a Sunday school. He did, yeah. yeah. So I, I was, was good, though. I was going to, um, so there's two sermons, one that I've actually heard and one that I've only heard a piece of, but there's a preacher by the name, you can look it up on YouTube, S.M. Lockridge. Um, he does this whole kind of riff on Jesus like that's my king and he goes and uh, I've heard that and I mean I just get chills yeah. because he's taking these theological tenets and he just he, the repetition that's my king yeah. you know he you know I, I think he talks about he died on the cross and rose from it that's my king he you know he raised the dead to life and and like you can feel it but a sermon that I've heard personally, uh, been in the room, um, you know, Brandon Samuel was a pastor I grew up with. I interned under him. He's actually not that much older than me. And, you know, there's a type of sermon, it's called first person narrative. Yeah. I kind of wish we did it more. So he actually pretended to be mm -hmm. Hosea. And when I say pretend, it's, it's making sermon a little bit more of an art form, but it's mm -hmm. scientifically kind of going through the message, but he was preaching on Hosea. And he kept coming back to this one phrase. He goes, you know, when you can't trace God's hand, you can always trust his heart. Uh, and, you know, he's telling the life of Hosea. Hosea is this prophet that marries a prostitute. And it's this object lesson for Israel. And, and like, I just kind of remember being in the room and grabbed by that moment. Yeah. And, and I think what you and I are saying, and even Aaron, the question, like, every time you step up to preach, like... I think the healthy preachers realize 
there's ego and I would say pride pride is ego but it's also insecurity it's basing mm-hmm. more of what you do with God but there's also this sense of God is very present in the room and speaking to his people yeah and you're just a sobering part of that story and how do I participate in that but not get in the way of that mm. which takes me to this idea of, um, of when I went to pastor at Edgewood out in Brighton um, on the pulpit my first Sunday I got up to preach and I hadn't been in the pulpit and I noticed that taped on the top of the pulpit was we would see Jesus mm. and I didn't know why that was there I thought well, that's a nice touch later I was going through some books my predecessor had left on the bookshelf in the office and there was a marvelous book of lectures that were given to pastors in the 1950s and in it was a story of a British pastor who preacher who put that on his pulpit so he would not forget Hmm. that every time he got into that pulpit, it was to reveal Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. So I kept that on my pulpit, and when I went to my next church to pastor, I printed it out again and taped it on the pulpit because I didn't want to forget that. Hmm. People are there to see Jesus. Hmm. Oh, Lord, help me to show Jesus. Hmm. Then then you get into the whole character of the pastor as preacher, which is important too. But... Well, that's another talk. Well, I, I do want to lean there because I, I said we'd come back to it. And I think this is, I think Aaron can even jump in too. But is our struggle with preaching because we've seen the rise and fall of Mars Hill, because sure. we've seen these pastors fall? I mean, how are you ca- kind of contextualizing all of this in this season as, yeah. you know, just. I bet by the time this episode comes out, there's going to be another moral failure. Sure, yeah, every week it seems Mm -hmm. like. Yeah, that's the cynicism, I think, of our time. We've been so jaded, and we are so disappointed in religious professionals, so to speak, and the institutional church, that we are, um, I think, a hard crowd. We come with some bitterness and resentment over Mm -hmm. what's happened. That's the negative side. The positive side, I think good biblical preaching shines in such an environment. Mm. When people hear good biblical preaching, they respond. I think even the cynical ones respond. Mm. So I I think there's great opportunity in the midst of the cynicism. Mm. But there again, I think that takes work, and it also means the congregation has to expect good good preaching in a healthy way. So one small thing, and this is a very small thing, but I think it was very real for me. I went to a church where everybody sat in the back. Mm. And as a preacher, it was like you were shouting to the back of the bus. And the message to me was, we don't really want to be here. Um, now, maybe there were other dynamics there. Maybe that young children want to be near the nursery. I mean, I want to be charitable to them. But I encouraged them to say, you know, can we just begin to move more forward because this is not just dependent on me. Preaching involves you too. Your response can help allow the spirit to be at work or shut it down. So I think there's a very real sense of calling churches to say, what can you do to make your pastor a good preacher? Mm -hmm. So maybe to jump off of that a little bit, you know, people who are listening to this podcast, um, I'm sure a number are in churches right now and they, you know, they should be listening for good good preaching. Um, what about someone who maybe is curious about churches, hasn't quite found a church home yet? Um, what should they be looking for, listening for? What, what, what about the sermon element, the message element of a church yeah. service should people be looking for? Yeah, I think there's several things. One thing that comes to mind, obviously, is, is it biblical? Is the Word of God being opened to me? So is this a sermon that reflects a wrestling with the Word of God? Is this a messenger who is authentic? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is this someone who they won't get in the way of the message? Mm -hmm. They have a healthy concept of who they are in Christ, and pastoring and preaching is not about their ego. I think a third thing I would look forward to is, is the sermon part of a well 
put together worship service. So I don't think you can look at the sermon apart from the music and the call to worship and the use of sacraments. All those things should be in harmony. Uh, so I would encourage that expectation too. Mm, that's good. You know, um, <clears throat> my professor from college, Wes Smith, um, you know, he used to say, make Jesus uh, visible, beautiful, and believable to every person you meet. Yeah, so I like I, I'd say to the listener, you know, was Jesus visible, um, believable, and beautiful in that message? Yeah. You know, because if you could, sometimes when you say, is it all about Jesus? Like, it's pretty hard. Like, but if if he's visible and believable and beautiful, I think that that's yeah. helpful. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add, and I, I would also say to be charitable towards the preacher mm -hmm. because no one starts out as an excellent preacher. Mm -hmm. So you need to be uh, patient and call forth the best from that preacher um, and to recognize that even a boring sermon may have its place. Richard Middleton, who teaches out the seminary, is a good friend, uh, put on his Facebook post, um, in April, uh, a quote to the effect that C.S. Lewis got the idea for screw tape letters during a boring sermon. <laughs> so kind of like, maybe there's value even in a boring <laughs> sermon. And I think that's true. I think the act of going to worship, our minds may go different places during a sermon. And that's not necessarily bad, and that might even be redemptive at times. Hmm. Mm. That's cool. What a place to close. This is great. So we, uh, you do this all the time as a pastor. You clean up our messes. So Aaron and I are going to answer the question, what does Jesus have to do with this topic? And then, you know, whatever we mess up, you get to fix. Is that wow, great? Wow, that's, that's perfect. I love that. <laughs> you want me to go first or do you want to go first? Well, you know, I'm the non-preacher here, so how about I'll go first? Oh, sure. And you can clean my mess up and then he can clean your mess up. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think uh, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I think it, it has... Um, through the course of the conversation gotten to really what we originally were asking about and uh, there's a the the sermon the the message part of the of the service I feel like what I'm hearing is it's important and this is why Jesus would want us to be talking about it, it's it's a point where you can you can be encouraged by the reading of scripture you can be encouraged by music but the preaching is is a part where the application can be actually you can it can get zeroed in on your heart as somebody who's in that place in that time and someone who hopefully you can trust is mm -hmm. trying to help you apply that to your life yeah. and hopefully doesn't get themselves in the way. I, I think that's a very uh, powerful thing to think about and to kind of wrestle through and and be looking for in our in our in our local churches. Um, so yeah, that's my thought, Peter. What do you think? Um, man, that's a great thought. Um, you know, there, there's two stories that come to mind. You mentioned, you mentioned Jesus preaching the Luke passage. And, um, if you read the passage, it's essentially him dropping the mic. Like, yeah. you know, he says on the fulfillment drops the mic that was in a, a local context that had local beliefs. And, you know, one of the things I also think about is a lot of Jesus's miracles take place on the Sabbath in that context of preaching yeah. and you know this past weekend i went back to the church i attended in pennsylvania and my friend joe who i think is one of the most masterful preachers just knows pottstown pennsylvania has a heart and there's so many people on that staff i think of um carrie and Luis um and andrew who preach because they just they have such a pulse on mm. the congregation but you know, I'm listening to this sermon about ho godly hospitality, and I'm thinking about the individuals that are there, and I'm thinking about the core people. This church is only 17 years old, yeah. and I'm seeing what's happening. Now, I know I'm going a little bit longer, but, you know, people ask me, they're like, well, you're the online pastor, and you do a podcast, and, you know, my view is, has been this. Um, you know, we've never been more local than we've ever been before. And there's something that happens when you make it a habit of attending church each Sunday, yeah. not just the sermon, not just the worship. You know, I love Pottstown, Pennsylvania. I don't live there, mm -hmm. 
I miss this church when I'm not here. Yeah. There's something about being Rochester, knowing about Kodak and garbage plates and what people are facing. And I think what preaching reminds us of is just like every book in the Bible is written to an audience at a specific time in a specific place. We're called to take God's word and and share it in a specific time in a specific place. And we show up because we know that God's already there showing yeah. up. Yeah, wow. I love what both of you have said. Um, A couple of concluding thoughts. One is, uh, Scripture tells us that God acts, and then he explains his acts. The action he takes is redemptive. Mm -hmm. So there's always a word that accompanies God's acts. So I think God is at work in the world today. What's the word that accompanies what he's doing? I think preachers are charged with some of that. I think it's a really hard task to do today. I have great sympathy. I tell pastors who are starting ministry when they preach their first sermon, remember this is one sermon of hundreds people are going to hear. So don't load this with too much pressure. Just go be faithful. Anne Lamont, who um, writes about writing the truth, says, writing the truth is like giving a cat a bath. I think preaching is a bit like that, to be faithful to the text and to be true. It's not a neat, easy thing to do. It's it's difficult and challenging. So I want to encourage all the pastors out there, and I want to encourage people who listen to sermons to really open their heart to say, what might God say to me this day through this messenger? Because God is still speaking. Mm -hmm. Aaron, great idea. (laughs) <laughs> Great idea. So, do we get bacon now? I, oh, you know, man. I'm, bacon I'm, and I, coffee sounds good. Yeah. If, if you want the best bacon sandwich in Rochester, go to New City Cafe and get their BLT. They apparently use German bacon. So, oh, anyways, I'm going to take you up on that. There, there you go. You go. Uh, Wally, where's the best place people can find you if they're looking for you? Sure. Um, probably uh, if they would like to email me, uh, welcome to do so. Fleming, F L E M, one M. I-N-G-W at roberts.edu, and I'd love to hear from people. All right. Roberts Wesleyan College, home of the Red Hawks. That's right. There we go. We love it. So anyways, you can find us at whygodwhypodcast.com. The best way to get a hold of us is to go to that website, click subscribe. You'll find this episode and many others. Thank you so much for joining. (laughs) 